Historically, wildfire seasons were a four-month event in the middle of summer. Today, the average core wildfire season is 78 days longer than it was in the 1970s, with Colorado experiencing large fires every month of the year. Today, we're talking with Colorado Division of Fire Prevention and Control Director Mike Morgan and Wildlands Section Chief Vaughn Jones about the strategy the state is using to respond more effectively to Colorado's growing wildfire seasons. Well, 2020 was quite a year for fires in Colorado. We had um, 16 state responsibility fires um, in, in 2020 um, that burned about 650,000 acres. Um, we had about $185 million in state and federal costs for suppression. That doesn't count the, the local costs associated with it or the recovery costs or the impacts from you know, insured losses and economies, et cetera, et cetera, or, or let alone the, the closures of I-70 this year, um, Glenwood Canyon due to the slides, uh, the, the folks have lost their life at Poudre Canyon as a result of those slides. So um, it, it was an overwhelming year for us. Um, Cameron Peak, you know, largest fire and most destructive fire in Colorado's history, 469 structures, including 224 homes. Um, Three of the largest fires, five largest, three of the five largest fires in Colorado's history happened. Um, the, the thing that just kind of blew my mind with it was in, you know, here, the Heyman fire was the largest fire, happened in 2002, um, set there as the largest fire in Colorado's history for 18 years, and now it's set in number four on the list. It's kind of mind boggling. Um, we, we've done a lot of, of work together Vaughn over the last five years to try to make a difference and, and do things a little differently mm -hmm. and um, you know we've been very uh, proactive with looking at early detection and aggressive initial attack and enhanced state assistance um, and, and while we're not near as destructive in 2021 um, as we were in 2020 we're still the western part of the state southern part of the state early in the season uh, we're having some challenges and I just thought it'd be good to kind of maybe talk a little bit about how that's going and how that's looking for us. A couple of things, if you look at, you know, through July of 2020, we were probably saying we had, we were having an average or above average year. And then obviously things changed and it was the duration of what, you know, whatever the core fire season was all the way into November. And then like Mike said, you know, that, that, that fire growth and fire behavior, you know, it started on Pine Gulch outside of Grand Junction, where we saw 30,000 acres of growth in one night which that that was incredible by itself would have been one of the biggest fires you know we'd ever had and then you throw on you know the roughly 100,000 acres of growth on uh, and one in a 24-hour period on each troublesome and and to me it just shows that we are an entirely different dynamic than what we're used to in Colorado and across the country Well, I, I think to start off with, you know, is is kind of our approach from from the state standpoint, from an EFPC standpoint, to how we manage wildland fire in Colorado. And and to me, it starts with, you know, Mike and I talk about this a lot, doing things different. Smart firefighters do things different, and it's trying to use technologies, things like the multi-mission aircraft, the fire guard program, to detect fires early on. And what that allows us to do is, you know, gather information on that fire pass it on to that incident commander, the decision makers, so that they can take early informed decisions, order the right resources, and take appropriate next steps rather than spending, you know, hours trying to figure out what a fire is doing, where it's at, those kind of things that we used to have to do in the past. And then to me, really, then Mike, it's, it's going from, you know, finding those fires, what's the appropriate action, and then for the, the state side of things, you know, it's uh, the state assistance is our ability to provide um, resources to either the county or the fire department that they may not have or may not need. Things like aviation, um, hand crews, uh, funding for those because you know when, when you have a volunteer fire department that's literally you know cooking you know pancakes to put gas in the fire trucks they're not going to be able to afford a, you know a large air tanker or something like that so it's providing those aviation resources, the ground resources, you know engines, modules, and then also our, our DFPC staff around the state for that technical assistance to help whatever it is that those local agencies need to take early appropriate action. And, you know, I think something that Mike and you and I talk about a lot is, um, you know, there's a lot of areas in Colorado 
where frankly we don't want fire period you know we, when you look at the values at risk um all the you know the impacts that a fire is going to have we want to take that early aggressive action and, and really you limit the you know the, the size the duration the impacts and the suppression cost to the local communities yeah, I, I couldn't agree more and i think that's one of the things that that we're challenged with right now is, is the messaging you know is it there there's conflicting messages out there about when is fire good when is fire bad and and everywhere i go i hear that you know well well some people are telling us that we should be letting you know more fires burn and and it's really important for for all of us to be better at our messaging to say you know fire in, in the right time at the right place with the right conditions and the right resources fire on the landscape can, can be a good tool it can be a really good thing it's part of the it's part of life it's part of nature and um, yet when we have three million people in the wildland urban interface and we have the fuel conditions we've experienced the drought conditions we've experienced the size of the fires that are stretching resources you know, across the entire west you know, way too thin you know the the ability to use those tools um you know, it just has to be that right window and and i'm hoping i'm, I'm optimistic that you know we're trying to do a lot of work with our partners at uh, colorado state forest service and the dnr and u.s forest service and blm about making sure we're getting that right messaging out there uh, because I, I think honestly by not getting the right message out there we're we're confusing the public um, and we just have to do a better job of that um, and, and then to, to that, you know, enhanced state assistant component, you know, and just to me, you know, I, I remember the days of, you know, years ago, I've been doing this a long time, but, <laughs> um, um, but, but I remember the days of, you know, where you weren't even allowed to order an aircraft until the sheriff was on scene where we were at. Um, so that that in itself is the recipe for disaster, and, and not that I could afford to pay for it, a helicopter or a large air tanker or something like that at the time. So this this enhanced state assistance model um, is really proven to us that over and over and over that by spending a few dollars up front, we're saving millions and millions of dollars in the long run, and not to even mention the. The long-term costs, the, those recovery costs are less. Right. The economic impacts are less. The insured losses are less. I mean, it's it's really changing that whole model of how we've looked at fire in the past. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, and like like you and I have talked, you know, when you know, depending on which study you look at for the large, you know, the really large fires, the suppression costs are nine to eleven percent of the total impact. So you know, you start doing math, and you know, on on a forty to a hundred million dollar fire you know, times 10, those um, become really big impacts and costs. Um, and I think, you know, and like Mike said, we've, you know, we've been, we've been fortunate that last winter, especially from the governor's office, the legislature, they really invested into kind of a holistic approach for fire. And that's, that's the fuel treatment, the mitigation and the suppression side. And on the suppression side, you know, like what we've done is we, our existing helicopters and seats, we extended the contract so that they match kind of more what our core fire season is. Um, we added, you know, a new thing that we added was a large air tanker that's on contract um, to the state that we'll talk a little bit more and then eventually getting a type one helicopter as well. And then the other thing we did, that I think that'll have, that already had some big impacts this year was, um, you know, the adding the, the, the tools and activities under state assistance that we can do where we have funding finally from the state side to pre preposition those resources based on whether it's NCs or fire activity ahead of time to help those local agencies. Yeah, I want to build a little bit on something you said early on in that one and, and the, you know, that the headwaters economic studies and different things that show you nine to eleven percent of the costs of fire being suppression mm -hmm. with ninety percent of the cost being the other impacts of that and and when you see a, a glenwood canyon um, type of fire i believe there's about 32 million dollars in suppression on that fire um, but then when you close i-70 for weeks on end and and you disrupted the the, the people that work you know in Eagle County, the Vail area that live in the Garfield County area, and just the overall impacts are, I can't imagine how much was lost. But then, then we take a look at the, you know, the enhanced state assistance models we've been using, and there's 159 fires between um, 18, 19, and 20, um, 159 times that we provided enhanced state assistance. Um, we spent about $6 million. Uh, in total. In total, yeah. for those 159 incidents. And while $6 million is a lot of money, 
most people across the state would there wouldn't be a recognizable name on any of those flyers. Exactly. Um, so, so by what we're doing here, um, you know, to, it is a, it's disrupting that model of saying ten percent versus ninety percent when we when we take this kind of a management yeah. approach uh, because we didn't see you know sixty or seventy million dollars of other impacts as a result of the fires that we were providing this enhanced state assistance on. Yeah, and I think it's that concept like we're talking about, spend a little up front, save a lot on the back end. So, you know, in this case, we're talking, again, it's real money, it's big money. But when you're talking tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands on day one of a fire for suppression and then essentially eliminating those other consequences on the back end, it's, it's a good investment, obviously, and you know, from our standpoint. I, and I think one other thing, you know, we, you, you mentioned it too, but to just reiterate is that, you know, the partnerships we've had with our, our local fire chiefs and sheriffs and commissioners, the, the folks on the Colorado Fire Commission, uh, the governor's office, the legislature that are that are really looking at the work we're doing and, and paying very close attention to it and making those investments so we can have a meaningful impact. You know, it's... Uh, one thing I wanted to do was use this opportunity to kind of give some examples from the 2021 fire season, you know, obviously not as active as 2020 or 2018, but just kind of show the value of this enhanced state assistance we've been talking about. So in the last week alone, our, our DFPC aircraft have responded to 13 different fires across the state with a total of about 100 flight hours. And then in addition to that, you know, we, we flow on a search and rescue mission in Uray County and help Colorado Parks and Wildlife with restocking fish in a high elevation lake. So that, you know, that by itself is pretty impressive. Um, and then when we, we talked about the technology, so the MMA, the multi-mission aircraft, found 40 new fires that had been previously undetected in that week. And we, um, they also, the MMA provided mapping support to eight different fires that actually started to grow. So that, that's an example of using that technology that we talked about to do things better. And then our seats, our large air tanker, and our helicopters, you know, from a tactical response standpoint, had 35 different missions. Um, and that included over 134,000 gallons of retardant and water delivered. And then in addition to the aviation resources, we had modules and en engines responding both to wildfires across the state, as well as helping those local communities with all hazard um, responses and other kinds of incidents and giving those sheriffs and chiefs um, you know, that, that technical assistance on those wildfire events. Um, and, and I'm going to ask a couple of questions primarily because I already know the answers, but, um, but it's, it, you said, uh, the week of August 24th, starting that week, um, on August 24th, how many large air tankers were there in the state of Colorado? There was one large air tanker in Colorado and one large air tanker in the entire five state Rocky Mountain region. Okay. And uh, whose who's aircraft was that contracted with? Uh, DFPC, the state of Colorado. Do we think that having that aviation asset here made a difference in the size of these fires as we're talking about this model we're trying to use? I think absolutely, yep. Yeah. So, the answer. And, and I'm asking Vaughn loaded questions, right? Because we both know the answers to it, but, but it's just that illustration of you know, where if we did not have an exclusive use contract for a large air tanker with operational control under us, then we would be relying on Boise and NIFSI, um, the National Interagency Fire Center, to prioritize resources on where those go. And we would be competing with 19 states um, that are in various conditions for fire that um, so uh, I just think it's important that as we have these conversations everybody understands the difference that makes when we don't have to um, call and ask for a, a, an aircraft to be diverted you know from someplace in in California to be released from a fire that can be moved to Colorado to to help support what we've got going on here on a bad day. So, um, and, and I think probably, and I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but I think probably from the, uh, the type one helicopter and, and the type two helicopters were probably in the same boat um, with those. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, it depends on which day because the aircraft move a lot, but I know from, and you know, dialing down to a Colorado standpoint, um, last week we had four single engine air tankers in the state and two of those were DFPC, and then we had a total, I think, of five um, helicopters that were available for initial attack, and three of those were DFPC helicopters. So again, to me, it's that value. 
Um, just like Mike said, the operational control, we, we can make those decisions here in Lakewood with input from our field staff versus at, at NIFSI up in Boise, which are based on the priorities of, of the other you know states in the Western United States. I'm sure, um, I'm sure even our federal partners would be grateful last week for us to have that exclusive use large air tanker because most of those fires they were flying on were actually federal fires. They weren't state responsibility fires. Exactly. Yeah. And, and I think to add on to that, Mike, um, I know we, we got kudos earlier in August from the BLM in Wyoming um, because we, they, they, they used our air tanker for a day. We'll loan those out, as you know, you know, if there's, if there's not a Pending mission in Colorado where we can go to say Wyoming and get back in the same day will help our partners out. So we helped in the month of August, we helped Wyoming, South Dakota and Nebraska out. And I think frankly, in talking to those folks, um, you know, when, when you look at the big fires going on in the rest of the Western United States, given the size of those fires and, and the relatively low values at risk, they probably wouldn't have got that aircraft if you hadn't had available here in Colorado. <laughs> things are changing in Colorado and, and a couple things that you know that we're trying to do is you know for our firefighters is make them year-round not relying on that old seasonal model of doing things um, and it's to me it's 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 meeting the needs of the fire problem but also taking care of our firefighters giving them you know year-round employment um, benefits all of those things you know to be a professional year-round fire service you know, that's, and I think that's the ground resources side. And then you look at, like we talked about a little bit earlier, what we're doing with our aviation resources under state contract is extending those where they're not just available from June to August. It's into to meeting our fire needs in Colorado. And then I think in particular, it's also what other gaps can our aviation resources, you know, help fill for the local agencies, whether it's search and rescue or, or you know, helping Parks and Wildlife or CDOT or whoever it is. So I think it's it's moving that model towards what it needs to be in the future for Colorado is how I think see things currently. And I think I guess I would turn it over to you for what you see as kind of next key steps as, as we move forward with this process. Um, no, it's really exciting to see all this stuff coming together. It just makes sense. I mean, it, it, you know, seeing the successes is really cool. Um, I think what's next, you know, I, um, you know, we we put together kind of that slide that, that we call it our bubble slide, right? That has you know the holistic approach to looking at Colorado's fire problem, and that that it takes more than just suppression and, and vegetation management to be good at it and to be effective at it. You know, we're changing all of those models, and we still have work to do in, in all those areas. But I think you know specifically, you know, we, we've got the resources, the equipment, uh, the regional and statewide mutual aid system, uh, which is a, a big thing for, as you know, I mean, is, is being able to move the resource existing resources that we have now yeah to be able to move those around yeah. um better more efficiently I mean, tracking and safety and all those things that come with it um you know the i think you know as, as you know the uh, the firehawk helicopter the helicopter you know is going to be delivered sometime next year and now all of a sudden the extended aviation contracts that you know year-round um firehawk um, now all of a sudden it's like, well, how are we going to be effective at dispatching those as a whole you know, for those longer seasons where we historically relied on an interagency center that's seasonally staffed based upon what the federal land management agencies need, which is at the higher elevation and the different things. It's just not the same as the, the public mm -hmm. safety challenges we're faced with. So, so looking at how do we move resources around better? I mean, it inevitably says, well, we, we need to take a look at, you know, how do we move fire resources? How do we dispatch those more efficiently? Um, and, you know, so I think those are the next things on the horizon. And, you know, and we're, we're looking into those things and how can that be you know, effective? Um, you know, and, and that's on the suppression side, but then to get kind of to the holistic part of things, you know, you, you think about technology and the stuff that Ben and everybody at the Center of Excellence is doing. And, and you know, super exciting that even, you know, the folks at, uh, you know, Firehawk and Sikorsky are looking at the work that the Center of Excellence is doing going, wow, that technology could really make the Firehawk even better. Um, and so those types of things, you know, the ATAC and the, the, the heat sensors and, you know, being able to give latitude, longitude to hot spots versus waiting for a flame front and provide that information to pilots yep. to be more aggressive with how we're doing things. Um, and then you look at, you know, hardening of communities. You know, of course, the governor um, wrote the letter to the fire commission asking, asking the commission to look at, you know, land use, 
of development and building resiliency because it is it's a holistic approach there's more we can do about lessening this problem so you know that the, you know those groups are starting to meet and have those conversations so i think there's uh, you know i think we've made some significant progress i think there's a lot of work to do uh but it's um as you and i've joked on a lot of a lot of occasions is it keeps us busy you know um busier than what we want to be i think sometimes mm -hmm. but but it's a good problem to have. It's an exciting time to be a part of, you know, the movement of, of doing things different, doing things more efficiently, um, and being part of, you know, uh, you know, an organization, a division that has just got so many talented and gifted people that, you know, you just kind of sit back in awe when you see everybody work and they're doing their thing. You're just like, wow, it's really cool to be a part of that.